So today I want to talk a little bit about spiritual independence. And I want to talk about finding our freedom to connect with spirit in ways that work for us, in ways that work personally for us. The way we get past what we call spirituality 101, kind of the theory, kind of the thinking, and move into our own ability to connect with God, with spirit, with our creator in ways that grow us and ways that nurture us. Now, we live in a wonderful place because the research I did shows me that our founding documents were inspired in large part by the same spiritual concepts that inspire and motivate us. Now, you know what a goober I am for history. And you know what a goober I am for American history. So I, constitutional history, I love the 4th of July, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our founding documents and what I found out. The Declaration of Independence. In its second paragraph, it articulates the individual rights on which our civic lives are based. What are they? We all know what they are. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Isn't that a great thing to have in a civic founding document, the pursuit of happiness? That's amazing. Just sit with that for a minute. These are spiritual principles in the Declaration of Independence, launching us away from Great Britain and on our own path. So, since July of 1776, we have identified other rights arising from these global rights. What are they? The right to privacy, the right to travel, the right to marry, the right to speak our minds and associate, a whole bunch, this is not a lecture on constitutional law, but a whole lot of individual rights that arise out of the umbrella of those profoundly important foundational rights life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now those rights have changed as our society evolves, as we grow in our awareness of what makes us human, what makes us live better in community, those rights have grown. We have rights today that were not recognized back then because our society has changed. In the past 240 years, we've realized that there are other components of happiness and liberty that we didn't know about back then. But the entire sweep of those rights continue that we and we continue to identify arise from those fundamental rights life liberty and the pursuit of happiness they tell us who we are individually and in relationship to each other the declaration also stated which was an amazing contention for that time that these individual rights which have been endowed on us by our creator another amazing thought are unalienable rights unalienable rights. Okay, now that is a word. It's a legal term. It thrills the hearts of lawyers. Okay. <laughs> but for the rest of the planetary universe, it may not be a word they use every day. Jefferson was a lawyer. You can just, I'm going to put in a word there that nobody knows. Okay. So unalienable rights. What do they mean? Unalienable rights are rights that cannot be taken from you. It comes from the Latin word alienus, which means other, belonging to another. Unalienable rights are rights which cannot be taken from you by anybody. They are also rights, and this is equally as important, that you cannot give away. We always think about rights as not being able to be taken, but they're also rights that you are not able to give away, even if you want to. That's the definition of unalienable rights. They are bound to you, always whether you want them or not. Think about that. Just sit with that for a minute. The rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness are bound to us. And nothing we do can push them from us. No one can take them. And we cannot even give them, even if we try. Even if we abandon them, ignore them, forget them, whatever, they are there. What a powerful statement in a political document. What a recognition of these foundational spiritual principles about the nature of our humanity and about the nature of the best way we live together in our civic community. So what were they saying? They were saying that our lives together and individually should not be based on hierarchy, should not be based on wealth, should not be based on position, but on the inherent dignity and freedom of each of us. The attributes that make us who we are, that should be the basis for our civic life. What a powerful thing. Now, do we always get it right? No, we certainly don't. But we keep trying, and we use those principles as our true north. 
Now here's something I found that was very interesting. Abraham Lincoln pointed out in a speech he gave on the Dred Scott decision that the Declaration of Independence could have established national independence without the second paragraph. It was completely unnecessary to declaring our liberation from Great Britain. They could have just sent a shorter letter. They could have said, we're out of here. We're not happy. You're there. We're here. You're taxing us. You're doing a whole lot of things we don't like. Bye. But they didn't. They gave a whole litany of powerful and profound spiritual reasons and not even just spiritual reasons, emotional reasons, profound reasons for why we were making this break. They were doing something big and so they had to give it a very a big reason. They had to give it a powerful force. There was no need to mention the human rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He wrote, the assertion that all men are created equal was of no practical use in effecting our separation from Great Britain. It was unnecessary. As he saw it, the founders were setting out a timeless truth for future use. They were sending us a memo. They were not telling Great Britain. They were telling us, this is why we are doing this. We are doing this so you can live this way, so you can live the way free and strong and proud people are supposed to live. He saw the Declaration as the embodiment of a moral ideal. This is still Lincoln. He said, it was not the mere matter of the separation of the colonies from the motherland, but something in that declaration giving liberty not alone to the people of this country, but hope to the world for all future time. That was a memo to posterity. It was that which gave promise that in due time the weights should be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have an equal chance. It was like a memo to history. This is how you should live. This is how you should regard each other. The courageous men and women who risked everything, they risked their fortune, their lives, their reputation, everything, to travel the road toward independence, they were what? They were students of the Enlightenment. We've talked about that. The age in which the ideals of liberty and equality, the abandonment of superstitious orthodoxy, the flight toward rational and free inquiry came to the fore. That was the power of the Enlightenment. And those were the attributes, the principles that were endowed in each of us, unalienable, whether we want them or not, whether we recognize them or not, whether we use them or not, we have them. They had a new and a different belief in who they were and who they had a right to be. They gave that ideal to their posterity. Who was their posterity? It's us. They wanted us to know that this is who we are. They envisioned and created a system of government as close as they could get it at the time. Okay, they were culturally bound. They were children of their generation as well, so they didn't get it entirely right. But telling us that we needed to live these values, enabling us to live these values. And they stepped into this new reality untried and unexplored. They knew that they had to declare this declaration of who they were before the reality of change could begin to happen. They had to articulate where they were going before the power of change could happen. So what does that mean? In the language of metaphysics that we know, they invited the universe to join with them in this new beginning. They said, this is what we believe. This is who we are. And what did they do next? They stepped into it. And they invited creativity to come with them. And it did. This attitude made the difference. A much later American, Wayne Dyer, wrote, that you don't attract what you want, you attract what you are, right? You don't attract what you want, you attract what you are, which is why it's so important for us to be always aware of what we are, of who we are, of the energy we are putting out, not just by our behavior, but I mean, not just by our attitudes, but also by our behavior, because that shows the world who we are. These men and women lived their beliefs deeply and profoundly, and they passed that imperative on to us. Author Wendy Lustbader wrote, this is how freedom begins. Think about this. This is how freedom begins. We have to dare to venture beyond the familiar landmarks of identity to locate the next version of ourselves. We have to have the courage to step out beyond the familiar 
to locate the next better, more aware version of ourselves. So that was what was happening in 1776 a lot. I was so excited when I found out that Abraham Lincoln had said that about the Declaration because it's so true I never thought about that. All that stuff was just a message to us for later. This is why we are doing this. So later, others stepped in to provide a spiritual, a more spiritual voice to this energy of independence. And who was that? Another of my favorite people, Ralph Waldo Emerson. We all know Emerson here in this community. Sixty years after the Declaration, on July 15th, coming up is the anniversary, 1838, he stood in front of the graduating class of the Harvard Divinity School, and he gave what's been known as, strangely enough, the Divinity School address. Now, attending that were how many graduates? You tend to, I mean, it was such a foundational document. There were six graduates there. There were seven, but one was too busy. There were six graduates there, and their families, and the faculty. And he gave this transformative, the group wasn't this big. He gave this transformative address which has served as a foundation of new thought ever since. So at this point in his life, Emerson is what? He was a Unitarian minister, which he, he, he defrocked himself is the way he put it. Because he started studying Eastern religions and he decided that Buddhism and Hinduism showed him that Christianity was not the only form of revelation. So now see today we'd go, yes, so what? But he said, no, I can no longer do this. So he took himself out of the business of being a Unitarian minister. He was a leader of the Transcendentalist movement, which taught, in summary, that God was found in nature, in each of us, and in all things surrounding us. God is imminent, as long as we proceed unfettered by human institutions. So on that day, the day of the Divinity School address, he spoke of the power of each person in that room to experience the divine without external help or guidance. Now, we're still talking about being free, so think about this. He told them that each of them had the inherent power right then to experience the divine himself. Back then, today we would say himself and herself. He urged the graduates to, quote, go alone, to refuse the good models, even those that are sacred in the imagination of men and to dare to love God without mediator or veil. Isn't that great? Yes. You just dare to love God yourself without mediator, says the mediator, or veil. <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. We walk into it ourselves, and that's the power he communicated to them. He spoke of an indwelling supreme spirit, an indwelling supreme spirit and of a vision as, quote, similar to that of the Eastern sages, where we are neither fallen nor depraved, and where divinity incarnates at every instance, not just once in the distant past. Isn't that great? It incarnates every instance as us, through us. He reminded them that God is, not was. Right here, right now, it's not just a guy born back then that we're all supposed to worship. It incarnates as us. Every step we take, we are God creating and incarnating. That's what he told them. He cautioned his listeners to stay away from formalism, to speak from their hearts and not from a book. This is strong stuff, telling a bunch of graduating ministers from the Harvard Divinity School. He told them that they had the ability themselves to connect with the divine. And he described one such instance that had happened to him. Listen to this thing. Just imagine him telling these guys. And the fact that, stay, this is what he wrote. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. Can't you just see the faculty like you're know, reaching for the, the smelling salts or something? I am part, and they remind you of that time when I told you earlier, I wrote I am God on the board when I was 10, and the minister said, no, you're not. I mean, I could just see the whole faculty going, oh my God, this. His quest was for an experience of God, not intellectual or theological understanding. Direct experience of spirit. He got on a profound level that he was of spirit. And all he had to do was reach it. All he had to do was say yes. And that connection would be made. 
It was a huge revelation and a revolutionary one. Okay, so what happened to Emerson? The graduates loved it. They were going, yes, this is good stuff. I'm going to go teach this. The faculty and the parents, not so much. <laughs> he actually was banned by Harvard for 28 years. And then later when he turned out to be Ralph Waldo Emerson, oh yeah, they came back and he, they, he got an honorary degree, but he was not very popular at the time. So, just as Emerson declared our freedom to find our own spiritual path, to make that own connection, just as the colonies threw off the yoke of what had been, so are we to find our spiritual freedom. We are invited, we are compelled to take that new form, to step into the next version of ourselves, driven by nothing but what our own hearts tell us about who we are supposed to be and how we are supposed to show up. That is how we find our spiritual freedom. i got to tell you, when I think about these talks, when I think, what am I going to say? Well, you know, think of something interesting. Think of something complex. No, it's not complex. Be kind. Be loving. Feel in your own heart what it is you are supposed to express. This stuff, and that's the message. This stuff is not complex. I was reading a story by, I think it was by Richard Rohr. And he was talking about a friar that he knew who started a community of monastics. And this guy barely didn't speak. I mean, he gave one, one message the entire 20 years he lived there. His message was his life, just the way he lived. That's what we do. Our message is our life. It's not complex. And we make it so much harder than it is. How do we do that? We make it hard by trying to memorize the books, going to the seminars, listening to the experts. We say, this is so complex, I can't do it. No, we can all do it. We can all do it right now, just by being who we are, where we are, and expressing as God as best we can. Because nobody can express as spirit, as you, better than you. That's the secret to finding your spiritual independence. We are not looking at a fix that will make us free. We're not looking at the, the mantra or whatever that will give us the spiritual to make us free. We are already. All we have to do is say, I will. All we have to do is say, yes. Spirit is within us now, moving as us, through us, in us, unalienable. A word that we need to remember. We cannot give it away. Nobody can take it from us. Nobody can take it from us. We uncover our freedom, our spiritual independence, when we awaken to the truth. That as we've been looking so many places for us, it's always been here. Ernest Holmes wrote, and in this quote, he, uh, whenever I say the word truth, he's capitalized it. I love these quotes. I know the truth about myself. I know the truth about everything I do. I know the truth about everyone I meet. I know the truth about every situation in which I find myself. The truth is not only perfection, it is also power. Think about that. It is also power. It is. It is not only presence, it is also action. There the truth and the power and the presence and the action of the living spirit flow through everything I do, say, and think. I know the truth, and the truth I know frees me and keeps me free. It's all up here. It's all here. It's all the connection between here and here. The truth we know, the truth we live, is what keeps us free. Okay, so what stops us? How come we're all not levitating three feet above the floor right now? What stops us from doing this? Why are we not walking around feeling light and joy and powerful all the time? I don't. I, every morning I wake up and the first thing I think is all the stuff I haven't gotten done yet. Why? Because of the way I am looking at things. And maybe that is true for you because of the way you think. Because of the way our beliefs and our attitudes filter what happens to us. So as I was thinking about this, I came across a paradigm that is useful for me. And I'm going to share it with you. It helps me. Three types of reality. Think about three types of reality. One is ultimate reality. Ultimate reality is what Holmes was talking about. We are whole, we are complete, we are divine, just as we are. Power flows through us. Ultimate reality. We are manifestations of spirit here on earth. Okay, that's way cool. 
Next reality is physical reality. That is this. That is this suit. That is me looking at you. That is the world we live in. That's me getting in my car and driving home and somebody cutting me off and me being very ugly. Right? That is physical reality. The third one is distorted reality. And what is distorted reality is where we live, where I so often live. Distorted reality is how our ego mind reports back to us what is happening. Right? I mean, I, the thing I thought of was fake news, but it's not fake. Distorted reality is how we interpret the physical reality back into our heads. It distorts through our ego, it distorts through our judgments, it distorts through our expectations. I found this a wonderfully useful way to think about this. Why? Because my goal is to keep my eye on the ultimate reality, which is the truth of who I am. That is what keeps me free. When I am depressed or frightened or angry, what happens? My unskillful, as the Buddhists say, my unskillful thoughts shout at me. I can't get through this. I'm not up to it. I can't do it. It's too much. I don't have this. I don't have that. A painfully limited and false sense of self. Now, where do these voices come from? I'm so efficient. I make them up. <laughs> and then I limit myself with them. I'm like a one-man band here. I can do it all. I can get up in the morning on a beautiful day like this, make myself feel terrible, and then believe it. <laughs> this is great. But it's a choice I have, and it's a choice that all of us have. Buddhist teacher Ajahn Chah says, whatever the mind tells you, don't fall for it. Isn't this great? It's only a deception. Whatever negative comments and views it offers, just say, that's not my business every time and let it go. Wouldn't that be great? That's not my business. And just let it go. Whatever our circumstances, our freedom arises, our joy arises, we become lighter when we keep our minds and our eyes focused on the ultimate reality. Okay, so, stay with me. Does this mean that we ignore physical reality? Does this mean that I sit all day and just kind of go home and not worry about physical reality because I'm so focused on the ultimate reality? No. Because the physical reality is the place where the ultimate reality happens. The physical reality is where we put into action, which is key, our understanding of our ultimate reality. What does that mean? If I want to appear as the manifestation of spirit on earth, how am I going to behave in the physical plane? I'm going to be compassionate. I'm going to be kind. I'm going to be loving. At every opportunity where I have the choice, those choice points between the provocation and the response, what's in the middle? My choice. That's when I get to decide if I want to show up as the ego Melanie, screaming, maniac, gesticulating, God only knows, I'm going to cut that out of the video, or <laughs> as the ultimate reality, who I am here to be, who I can be, if I keep my eye on that truth loving and patient and kind and forgiving. Physical reality is necessary because that's how we bring into flower the ultimate reality that we are the truth of. Does that make sense? Yes. I have found that I am most free, and I can only talk about me, I am most free when I focus on that ultimate reality and I give it permission. I say yes to let it operate in every situation. Do I do it perfectly? No. Do I have wonderful teachers? Yes. Many of my teachers are in this room. Another one of my teachers are my kids. My son Nick, let me give you another Nick story, wonderful example. Nick hates to do chores. He feels that when he goes to his day program three days a week and he does like something for 20 minutes, that's it for the week. Okay. So he needs to empty the dishwasher. So I say, Nick, you need to empty the dishwasher. Not my job. And I say, Nick, it is your job. Catherine did it, boom, whatever, so it's your job. So what does he do? He has a choice. He can huff and puff, or he can do what he does, which is he decides it's the best job ever. <laughs> so then he puts on his hat, he puts on those wacky little gloves, which he doesn't need, and he says, my job. I do this, my job. And he just dives right into it, because he has made a choice to show up as the best he could be, given the fact that it's going to happen and he's going to do it. What a great teacher. I'm like, thank you. That is what he does. And I pay attention. I'm so lucky to have it. He shines 
after having made that point. So it's important to be we be aware of how we show up. And it's also important to pay attention to metrics of success, to what we want to accomplish. Let me give you an example. I read an article, I think it was in the last Unity magazine, about a woman, you guys may have read it, um, who teaches a course on financial success. She goes and she teaches other women to be financially successful. And she was feeling very dissatisfied. It just wasn't working. People weren't loving it. And so she thought, why? You know, I'm, pe people are, you know, they're making money and I'm being successful. I'm, you know, I'm teaching them about finances. But it wasn't right. And finally she realized that she was focusing on the wrong thing. She was using financial growth as a metric of success. And really what she was trying to do was help these women step into being great. She was trying to help them just grow and shine, and she was looking at the wrong indicator of success. So she decided that she would focus again on their growth, their joy, their development, their spreading their wings in the world, whatever choice of job they chose to do. And it just took off because she was looking at the wrong thing. She was playing small. She was saying, it's got to be money because that's what we use to measure. No. She had a vision that actually told her, she heard a voice that told her to go for greatness. And what it was telling her was to look at the right metric, not financial success. Teach these women that they needed to show up to be the people they are here to be, to shine their light, no matter how much they made. And that's another aspect of being free, I found is that no matter what my circumstances are, no matter if I am sick, if I am limited, whatever, I can still shine a light in every circumstance. Sometimes I think about getting really old, and I think about because my mother passed away and she was very ill and she was very limited before she died. And I think, God, if I get to be that age, which I hope I do and I am not able to do what I do now, I hope that I can at least pray for people. I hope that I can at least smile at people. I hope that I can at least do something to shine a light in whatever circumstance I am. Because that will be my job at that point. That will be how I move into ultimate reality at that point. We don't have to be rich or famous or smart or thin. We can do it wherever we are, every moment of every day. Isn't that liberating? Right now, we can do it. That, I think, is how we find our spiritual independence, at least for me. So that is my message for today. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, make that choice to show up as the ultimate reality in this world. That will liberate you because you always, always have the chance to do it at every moment. Thank you.